Our guest presenter, Howard Ferris. He is a distinguished professor of nematology emeritus from the Department of Entomology and Nematology at the University of California, Davis. Howard has uh, conducted research on the biology and ecology of soil nematodes, both as pests and as beneficial organisms. And he has this amazing website that he's going to be demonstrating called Nemaplex. It's an online resource of information on soil nematodes, their ecophysiological attributes and environmental impacts, including the host status of plants to the herbivorous nematode species. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Howard. And we're looking forward to hearing about roles of nematodes in soil ecology and soil health. Thank you for joining us. Okay, so yep. uh, are, you, are you seeing my correct screen here? Why don't you go ahead? I had to stop my share. And now if you can go back to Zoom and find the green screen, share screen button. Okay, so. Sorry about this. I know you, you had me practice this. But it's I all right. I there's lots of little things on my Go screen. Go bar, okay, maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go to Zoom, and I see you. Okay, so now I'm going to share screen. Mm -hmm. And then you'll get a choice of what you share, and your PowerPoint presentation should be among those choices. That's it. It's coming up. Yep, there you're. You got it. Okay, are we on the and we're on the right page here, huh? We're on the front page. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so I need to start. Sorry for the delay. Yep. The the video okay, is moving. There we go. Mm -hmm. Yep. Got it. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's been very interesting this morning uh, listening to all these presentations and the kind of overlap of principles and philosophies that, that thread uh, all the way through them. So um, uh, I'm going to talk a little about the role of nematodes in soil ecology and their uh, impact on soil health and the soil food web. And if we have time, I'll, I'll introduce you to the Nemaplex website. Uh, so, first of all, just a little about, wait a minute, stop things, okay. So, first of all, a little about uh, uh, nematodes. And as you heard in the earlier presentations, uh, nematodes are, are simple multicellular organisms. Most of the species that are in soil are probably less than two millimeters in length, and a lot of them less than one millimeter in length. Uh, they, they're aquatic organisms. Uh, they live in the water films around soil particles, and so for activity, the soil must be moist, but they can certainly uh, tolerate dry soil and, and go into an anhydrobiotic state from which they recover when the soil becomes moist again. Uh, they occupy uh, any environment that, that provides nutrients and, and, and water. And we've talked a lot about, the, or heard a lot about the abundance of, the, of soil organisms uh, uh, and organisms generally this morning, uh, but it's estimated that 80% of the multicellular animals on the planet are nematodes. That's not 80% of the species, of course, but of the individual multicellular animals uh, are nematodes. Now, quite a, pretty hard to prove that, uh, but it's left based on observations of abundance of nematodes uh, by people like, for example, Cobb here, and Cobb uh, was a fellow 130 years ago, uh, sometimes called the father of nematology in the United States. Uh, among other things, uh, he described, uh, or in one paper, described 100 species of nematodes. And by doing that, he had uh, technical helpers working at these various microscopes, setting up slides with the nematodes he was interested in identifying. And then they could rotate the table around uh, so that he could. Uh, get on with the job of, of uh, doing the identification. And I'll talk a little about Wilson later. But nematodes generally uh, fit all kinds of uh, feeding habits. Uh, 
grazers, predators, parasites, omnivores, detritivores, and so on. Uh, and uh, so back to uh, E.O. Wilson. E.O. Wilson was uh, recently or died a couple of years ago, but he was a professor and entomologist at, at, at Harvard University and uh, um, worked a lot or, or thought a lot about the biodiversity generally. And uh, uh, so, but in, the, in his later years, he became intrigued with nematodes. And so, why are nematodes important to understand? He said they're uh, almost microscopic wriggling creatures that teem as free living forms and parasites everywhere on the land. They're the most an abundant animals on earth. Four out of every five animals is a nematode. And uh, it went on to say that if you could remove all the solid matter on the earth, you'd be able to see the, uh, uh, the outline of the plants and animals that have been there, and perhaps how the, how the land had been managed by the the, uh, uh, the types of nematodes that were there, and so he indicates that uh, almost certainly the world's ecosystems and our own lives depend on these little creatures, but of course on many other creatures that are interacting uh, with them. Uh, it, actually, some of that language that uh, that uh, Wilson used was. Uh, originated with Cobb 130 years ago, uh, who uh, was sort of a, uh, quite eloquent in his, uh, his detail of the uh, abundance, importance, and diversity of nematodes. So, but following on with Wilson here, uh, we say it's a nematode world. So here's the planet uh, teeming with nematodes. But what do we really know about nematodes and, and uh, how do we know it? Well, we know a lot about nematodes that are that affect us directly, right? By parasites of humans and domestic animals. So, for example, hookworms that, that might be carrying into the surface mucosa of the intestine, or guinea worms that here under the uh, under the skin. Uh, we know, uh, for example, uh, dog heartworm, Dyrophilaria, uh, would and most most uh, uh, dogs re receive some kind of treatment or or. or um, anti-helminthic uh, treatment to, to control dog heartworm. Uh, we know a lot about uh, nematodes like Ascaris, the intestinal parasites. Uh, and I talked about nematodes in soil being less than two millimeters in length. Some of these nematodes uh, are uh, 30 centimeters in length. And of course, here's uh, uh, elephantiasis uh, attributed to Wuchereria, uh, which is uh, affecting the lymphatic system of, of uh, of the human. So these are, are diseases that have been known for a long time and studied for a long time. But really it took them the development of the microscope for us to, to increase our knowledge of soil and freshwater and marine forms. So this is you know, three or four hundred years ago that the Janssens were, were, were developing primitive microscopes. Uh, and the next, and so that gave us the ability to look at these nematodes. The next thing I think that, that was important in terms of, of small uh, soil nematodes uh, goes back to Watson and Crick and the structure of DNA. So Watson and Crick and, of course, Rosalind Franklin uh, developed the structure of DNA. And uh, shortly after that, perhaps in the 1960s, Sidney Brenner, who was at the Med Medical Research Center in, uh, in Cambridge, uh, was thinking about how do you take this double helix? How does a double helix translate into an organism? What is it that, that how, what, what's the transfer? Uh, and how does that happen? And he happened to be visiting California and he ran into Ellsworth Doherty. Ellsworth Doherty worked at the, at the uh, Kaiser uh, Research Center in Oakland, but he also was an associate, had an associate professor position at University of California, Berkeley. Well, Doherty uh, was an, uh, an expert on rapididid nematodes. The rapididid nematodes are bacterial feeders, and uh, he had worked extensively with them. He had a, a graduate student, Margaret Briggs, and Margaret Briggs took soil samples in the Stanford Forest, so the, the forest at Stanford University in Palo Alto, and there Briggs and Doherty described Sinorabditis briggsii. 
and Brigzii, Xenorhabditis Brigzii is an important nematode because it's hermaphrodite, but under certain conditions of temperature, it will also produce males. So they could do sort of mating experiments and see how the uh, how the um, uh, the offspring and the on, and mutations and, var and variants uh, pass through the population. Well, so Doherty told uh, Brenner about that, and Brenner was intrigued. He went back to London and did some sampling and found a related species, Xenorhabditis elegans, which became the uh, the biological model for for. Uh, uh, for developmental biology, working with uh, with Brenner, with John Solston and Robert Forbes, all these guys got the Nobel Prize uh, for for the work that they were doing here. Solston was a particularly interesting guy because he could sit at the microscope for hours, uh, reportedly sitting there for forty eight hours continuously, mapping the uh, the the progeny of every. Uh, uh, of every cell division in the, that occurred in the egg. So, and of course, I, I can't identify what he was doing here with these sketches, but but he was able to trace the cell lineage of every of every cell division that occurred, the ones that became muscle cells or became uh, intestinal cells or became uh, became part of the reproductive system, and then. Horvitz, who was working with him, uh, uh, kind of worked on the idea of apoptosis, so that as these cells continue to divide, at some time they've got to stop dividing, otherwise the thing will grow forever. And that that stopping dividing is called, uh, essentially called programmed cell death, apoptosis. Okay, so at some stage, there's no more division and the, and the, uh, uh, the organism or, or part of the organism is complete. Okay, so let's look at, at the, the sort of relationship between form and function in, in, uh, in soil nematodes. Uh, soil nematodes that are parasites on uh, plants, feed on in plant roots, all are equipped with a stylet. Uh, a stylet can be inserted into root cells to withdraw the cell contents, and the nematodes may feed as endo. Uh, as endoparasites, which means they move into the plant root system and feed from cells and, and at preferred feeding sites, or they may be ectoparasites, where in generally they will have a longer stylet, uh, but the body remains on the outside of the root and they can feed several or many cell layers deep uh, without actually penetrating the root. So we can, we can identify nematodes that feed on plant roots. Uh, and then here are some nematodes that feed on soil fungi. And they've got much, in general, much more slender stylets, uh, but they, they are able to push those stylets into, into fungal hyphae and withdraw cell contents. Uh, often these nematodes that feed on fungi have got this large pumping structure. I should say the plant parasitic nematodes also have a, a pumping structure in the, in the esophagus, but it's, it, very large and more powerful looking in the in the fungal feeding nematodes. Uh, whether that means it's di more difficult to withdraw uh, or pump food, or pump uh, uh, the the so the solution out of a fungal hypha than a cell, I, I'm not sure, but I, I suspect that may be may the case. Here's the way that pumping structure works. So there's this uh, this uh, pump valve that oh, the pump that opens. Uh, and closes, and here it is being pulled apart by uh, being being uh, uh, opened and closed by the, the radial muscles of this uh, central structure. And there is a valve uh, in front of it and a valve behind it, so that it's pumping in one direction. Here are, uh, is a nematode that feeds on bacteria, and in this case, it's a nematode that we find in kind of enriched conditions where the soil solution has a lot of bacteria in it and this this uh, nematode has an open mouth and it just essentially sucks in the soil solution and removes bacteria from it and and here you see here's here's the same nematode with the the stoma and you can see here the pumping mechanism which happens to have some some uh, uh, hardened plates in it, uh, which appear to be uh, involved in grinding up the bacteria that move through the base of the esophagus into the, uh, 
into the uh, intestine. Here's another whole group of bacterial feeding nematodes. These are scanning electron micrographs to show anterior structures on the nematodes. Uh, and these are nematodes that, that are sort of a basal to, to any uh, nematode assemblage in soils. These are the ones that are able to survive when the resources become limited. Uh, they stir up the soil solution by moving their heads and moving these, uh, uh, and essentially, we think, <laughs> activating the, the soil solution or, or agitating it. And also perhaps by scraping bacteria off soil particles that might be adhering. So these guys work a little, uh, much harder for their food than the, that first bacterial feeding nematode I show you. Here are some predator nematodes. The one on the right here has a strong or, or a very sharp stylet with an opening in it that it pushes into its prey. Uh, and these are more generalist predators. They feed on nematodes, but they might they feed on other uh, microinvertebrates in the soil. This one is a more specialized predator of nematodes. So it will ingest the whole nematode, and as it ingests the nematode, sucks it in through, through its body, it gets torn up by the, that sharp tooth. So here we have the predator nematode with the ingesting it, and here the nematode uh, sucking the, the contents out of the uh, uh, body of the nematode. We'd like to see more of these nematodes in, in, in agricultural situations, but it turns out that they are among the most sensitive to the things that we do in agriculture. They're the most sensitive to, to soil disturbance the, and to uh, pesticides and, and, uh, uh, and fertilizers that we put into the soil, and I'll talk a little more about that later. So let's uh, talk about the soil food web, and we've heard a lot about soil food web this morning and the uh, soil health, but essentially the ability of the soil to perform its ecosystem functions, right? Uh, and so the, uh, the healthier the soil, the more ecosystem functions uh, the, that it's performing. And particularly, of course, we're interested in, in those that uh, sustain uh, plant and animal productivity, that maintain water and air quality, and support uh, uh, life on Earth, essentially. So many ecosystem services that soil organisms are involved in, and, we, and you've heard a lot about them, I've just thought about them, a lot about them this morning, uh, decomposing organic material, sequestering, redistributing minerals. As, as organisms move through the soil, they take the, 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 the uh, minerals that they may have uh, consumed are uh, moved to, to other areas. Very important, the mineralizing of organic molecules. So organic molecules that come from, uh, from uh, uh, organic material in the soil or that are uh, ingested from plant roots uh, are in organic forms which, uh, which cannot be taken up by plants. So, so excesses of, of organic molecules are mineralized and become uh, uh, various forms of nitrogen that are accessible and available to, to uh, plants. So there are many, many organisms in the soil, bacteria, protozoa, tardigrades, microarthropods, and so on, and they're uh, providing many ecosystem services, but they're doing it in a very diverse system, right? So, so we can look at uh, three different types of uh, soil here, or, or amounts of soil compaction or, or condition, and you can see they're quite different. But within any one of these, there are uh, large sand grains and small small uh, uh, particulate matter, and there's organic material, and there are water films around all of these uh, things, and, and some of these areas will be accessible to small organisms, but not accessible to large organisms. And uh, as we think about the soil profile, then, then uh, temperature and temperature fluctuations are going to change with depth. Moisture conditions are going to change with depth. And we're dealing with organisms that are very sensitive to all of those conditions. So for the, for the uh, 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 ecosystem services to be performed, uh, it must be beneficial to have a diversity of species. The diversity of species within functional gills. In other words, by functional gills, I mean those nematodes, for example, that feed on bacteria, uh, 
would be considered one functional guild. Uh, and if the bacteria are uh, out here in the in the large pores, they'll be accessible. If they're down here, they'll be less accessible. So uh, small nematodes would would uh, have greater access to those kinds of things. So diversity must be important. Uh, you've seen uh, we, we've talked about the whole food, uh, soil food web with uh, and carbon driving the system, right? That that the carbon is either coming from plants or it's coming from exogenous material that's a applied to the soil, broken down by by uh, uh, litter transformers, by insects and earthworms and so on, uh, available to fungi uh, or coming directly from plant roots, but either by, by the uh, nematodes and other organisms feeding on the roots or by root exudation, root leakage being taken up by bacteria that are then uh, available to, to nematodes, mites, uh, other organisms. So, and you know, we think about well, nematodes feed on plant roots, and that's that's an ecosystem service, or perhaps an ecosystem disservice. Uh, but really, the interactions among these organisms are probably more uh, as important or more important than the than the actual process of feeding itself, because it's just that interactions where where mineralization and 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 uh, uh, transport of organisms from one source, one one area to another, occur. So, and I was trying to think of of, of words that started with P that would describe all these things that occur in the food web. Certainly, partnerships, pro processing of of materials, forestry. You know, with the forestry, the the transport of other organisms, nematodes in the soil, uh, transport bacteria. To, to other resources. So bacteria will adhere to the, the body of the nematode, the nematode will move to, to uh, uh, other sources of organic matter and the bacteria are transported with it. Uh, nematodes that feed on bacteria, maybe 30 to 40% of the bacteria that are ingested by the nematode uh, uh, actually pass successfully through the, through the digestive system and are defecated, uh, still alive. So they're moved to the soil. And, and we heard uh, earlier today about uh, mites and other organisms being moved around by uh, by other arthropods. So lots of things happening in the soil. Uh, now, uh, I want to work uh, to talk a little bit about our ability to identify nematodes, not only as uh, in terms of their species, but in terms of their function in the soil. So. Here are, are a group of nematodes that have teeth. Uh, now th so this one has an obvious tooth uh, that, that and in fact, this one feeds on plants. Uh, uh, but here's another one that, that has a, a, a tooth that can be uh, inserted into a prey organism, for example, like that one I showed you of the, of the predator nematode. Here's an interesting one because and, and it's a larger, a larger picture of it below here. There's a tooth here, and uh, it looks like that would be it would be difficult for this nematode to ingest anything very large. In fact, what happens is it opens its uh, these parts of the, the the anterior part of the mouth fold backwards, and so the tooth is exposed, and it can just ingest whole nematodes uh, that will be ripped against that tooth. And, and of course, I showed you this specialist predator with with a large, uh, in this case, dorsal tooth and small kind of uh, uh, tooth that, that act like rasps that tear up the cuticle of the of the organism being ingested. Uh, and then the plant feeding nematodes. I already mentioned that that uh, uh, generally plant feeding nematodes with short stylets are either. Uh, ectoparasites, where they feed only on root hairs and epidermal cells, probably don't cause a lot of damage, or they're endoparasites and they move into the root where they can feed on individual cells and may cause a whole lot more damage. And ones with longer stylets generally, uh, um, generally uh, uh, ectoparasites. So uh, about uh, a little over 20 years ago, 25 years ago, Bongers, uh, Tom Bongers in the Netherlands, that well, you can look at all these nematodes with different different characteristics and kind of divide them into into a series of uh, 
uh, that that what he called the colonizer persister series. And essentially what he's saying is that some of these nematodes are opportunists and they increase very rapidly if resources are available. Uh, some of them are survivalists, like those ones with, with structures on their heads and so on, uh, that are able to survive adverse conditions. Uh, generally, these are feeding either feeding on bacteria or bacteria and fungi. And then others are predators, either generalist predators or specialist predators, but almost always more sensitive to adverse conditions than, than the, the, uh, the others in the series. Uh, and um, based on life course duration, growth rates, responses to resources, sensitivity to disturbance, Bongers divided, separated nematode in various families to those that are enrichment indicators, that it's those that are basal fauna, and those that are structure indicators. And what's very interesting is that those that are the nematodes that are structure indicators are also kind of indicating uh, the abundance and presence of other organisms with the same levels of sensitivity. Those that are enrichment indicators, and I guess it's not really rocket science to think about it, those that are enrichment in, uh, indicators are indicating the abundance and presence of other organisms that are not nematodes but are also responding to, to enrichment. So based on, on these ideas of Bongers, he had five categories of them uh, in, in between opportunistic enrichment feeders and, and those that are, that are more indicators of stability. Uh, we developed the idea of, of an enrichment index based on the proportional abundance of the, of the enrichment indicators and a structure index based on the proportional abundance of the, of the predator nematodes. So now the idea is from a single soil sample, uh, identify these, those, which category these, these nematodes are in and then plot it on a scale behind here. So if, if the structure index was low and the enrichment index was high, it would fit in this quadrant here. And there we would say that this is probably a pretty disturbed system because those nematodes that are sensitive are not here, right? the, the structure index is low. Uh, it's probably nitrogen enrich because there's a lot of bacterial feeding nematodes in there, which would support, uh, uh, which would support I mean, there were a lot of bacteria in there would support bacterial feeding nematodes. The carbon to nitrogen ratio is probably low. In other words, it's nitrogen rich. Uh, decomposition is primarily uh, bacterial and it's conducive. What I mean by conducive is if there's a, a, a plant uh, put in here that, that is susceptible to plant feeding nematodes, that there's nothing regulating the population of plant feeding nematodes. The plant feeding nematodes will increase very rapidly. Now, if it, if if our structure index and enrichment index had plotted in this quadrant, we'd say, well, there's more structure, there's more linkages in the food web, more things feeding on each other. And so, although it's still enriched because we got a lot of these enrichment indicators, the 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 populations of opportunistic species, say that the plant feeding nematodes, will be regulated because we have uh, more predators in the system. If it was down here, we'd say, yeah, there's still more predators in the system. Uh, the, the soil may be, in fact, be suppressive to, uh, to opportunistic species. Uh, the, 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 the soil is still fertile, but, but the, the, the carbon to nitrogen ratio is a little higher. In other words, you might think of this as, say, the redwood forest. No, we're not putting uh, ammonium nitrate in the, uh, in the in the redwood forest, but, so, but leaves and branches fall down, they decompose by fungi, uh, and uh, there's no disturbance. So there are a lot of uh, the, the, the uh, predator nematodes present. And so it's, a, it's a, you know, a, a not terribly fertile, but, but certainly regulated environment, as opposed to plotting here, where there uh, are no or very low populations of enrichment ind uh, indicators, very strong structure index, maybe some basal nematodes there. So a degraded system, a, a desert type of system, depleted of organic matter. What organic matter is there is high carbon to nitrogen ratio, fungal, 
but it will be conducive because if we start putting water and nutrients on here, the bacterial feed, I mean, the plant feeding nematodes will, will increase very rapidly and there will be no regulators. Okay, so that's the idea of this, this using nematodes uh, as in faunal analysis, assessing the condition of the soil food web. Uh, but these, uh, this faunal analysis, uh, the indices are useful. They sort of indicating what we were, allow us to hypo hypothesize the, the, the nature of the ecosystem in each of these environments, but they're not indicating the amount of stuff that's going on. They're not indicating biomass and metabolic activity. They're just proportions of numbers. And we could have a, uh, 100 nematodes in here that would plot there, or we could have 10,000 nematodes and it would plot here. And we have to say if there were 10,000 nematodes, the, the, the functional activity there would be greater than if there were 100. So how are we going to deal with that? So what's the magnitude of the function of the service? How much carbon is being processed? How much energy is being used? So to get to that, we uh, we got some assessments of the of the uh, life history of these different nematodes, or uh, kind of approximated the life history of, of these nematodes. So how big are they? How long does it take them to get to that size? So what is the rate at which they're accessing carbon uh, and nutrients to to get to that growth? Uh, and of course, so how much energy are they using in doing that? Uh, and that allowed us to use the same uh, nematode fall analysis, but add to it uh, what you call the the, the metabolic pro, the metabolic footprint. In other words, so so the in this direction is telling us how much structure is going on uh, there is in this how many how many regulators are there and how much enrichment. So the idea of, of trying to uh, uh, give some approximation. Of the of the degree of the function that that is occurring. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about some ecosystem functions that nematodes are are involved in. And uh, uh, so nematodes uh, have a higher carbon to nitrogen ratio than bacteria. And so as they take in uh, uh, carbon substances. They're taking in more nitrogen than they need for their body uh, requirement. And they excrete that nitrogen uh, in mineral form, in ammonium uh, uh, type form, which is, which is then available for uptake by plants. And so here in, these, uh, uh, in these columns, we have sand, and we, we incorporate it into the sand uh, organic material of different carbon to nitrogen ratio, ranging from uh, alfalfa meal with a low carbon to nitrogen ratio, in other words, high, high, uh, uh, in other words, nitrogen rich material, uh, ranging to, uh, let's say, rice straw, which has um, uh, a, uh, a high carbon to nitrogen ratio, in other words, uh, uh, much more recalcitrant in terms of degradation. Uh, and in each one, and of course there were there were this was natural soil, there were bacteria in there, uh, and we incorporated also in each one uh, different bacterial feeding nematodes, different species of bacterial feeding nematodes. Then each day we pour water in the top of this tube, and it has a drain hole in the bottom, and we catch the leachate, and we measure the amount of nitrogen that's in the leachate. So that's indicating whether well, I should say there were either the nematodes were present or the nematodes were not present, right? So we have a combination of, of each species of nematodes present or absent. And uh, uh, when we when we do that, what we find is that uh, organic matter of different carbon to nitrogen ratio. So here's a low carbon to nitrogen ratio, uh, alfalfa meal to high carbon to nitrogen ratio, much more straw kind of uh, uh, material. And uh, uh, one species of nematode, cephalobus, uh, either present or absent. When the cephalobus was present, there was 15 to 20 percent more nitrogen in these flasks being mineralized uh, on a daily basis than when the when the nematode was absent. And the nematodes were feeding on the bacteria and excreting the excess nitrogen, and that was consistent uh, across 
many species of bacterial feeding nematodes that we looked at. So uh, what does that mean? So we were at the same time doing experiments where we were comparing organic production systems with, uh, with uh, uh, more conventional production systems. And what we found was in the organic production system, the tomato crop, uh, when, if, we, if we grew a cover crop the previous fall and winter, uh, then the uh, then essentially what happened was when the cover crop was incorporated, uh, there was a, a flush of bacterial feed, uh, of bacteria because they, they were uh, and they were immobilizing the available nutrients, but uh, there was also a large abundance of bacterial feeding nematodes would feed on them and release the the or mineralize the the available nitrogen. On the other hand, if we did not uh, grow a cover crop the previous fall and winter, and uh, rather than when we started the the, uh, the tomatoes, we first of all incorporated compost as a as a source of nutrients for the for the plants. Then immediately we got a, a flush of, of bacteria. The nutrients were immobilized, and we saw uh, uh, symptoms of uh, of nitrogen deficiency deficiency in the crop. So let me, let me go to the next slide. So what we're seeing is, uh, this is now without growing the cover crop, what we see is when we plant the, the, the tomatoes in April or so, that there's a gradual increase in different species of bacterial feed nematodes. And this is one group, I should say, that are tolerant of low conditions or, or uh, uh, adaptable to low temperature conditions. And then when to get to the temperatures were getting warm in June and, and July, the populations of these nematodes decline. And this is the amount of nitrogen, the estimated amount of nitrogen being mineralized by these nematodes feeding. Interestingly, when, the, uh, uh, when, the, when that group of nematodes uh, started to decline because the temperatures got too hot, this other group, which are more tolerant of higher temperatures, uh, took over. So, so the function continued as long as there was a diversity of nematodes. Now, the thing about the, the, uh, uh, the cover crop, if we grew the cover crop in the, uh, in the previous fall, then there had been resources available to the bacteria and the nematodes all during the fall and into the winter. And so we start off with a population level here. Uh, and so there's much more nitrogen being mineralized because there's a lot more activity in the food web and we do, we don't see the uh, uh, we don't see the the, the um, uh, symptoms of uh, of nitrogen deficiency. Here's another uh, ecosystem service. In this case, the regulation those those uh, those nematodes that are are predators and parasites. And this was in the in the Napa Valley of California, uh, and in a vineyard right next to the the, the coastal range. So you can see here these these oak. Uh, trees, and this is the this is where it was. Right, so we're, this is a vineyard right up against the oak trees, and uh, we we do our enrichment index and structure index, and the green squares are uh, the condition in the vineyard here, which is very productive. It's getting uh, uh, fertilized and so on. So that there's a lot of bacteria and activity, a lot of bacterial feeding nematodes, but sufficient disturbance, either chemical or or otherwise, that not many predators. On the other hand, 20 feet away, up in the in the in this slight hill here, uh, still fairly enriched, but a lot more predators. So so now we take these soils from these these two locations, and we introduce a nematode species that is not there that we can recognize. So and then we find out when the when the predator prey ratio of the original soil is low, as in the in the vineyard here. Uh, the soil is less suppressive to the introduced nematode than when the predator prey ratio is high, as in the uh, yeah, that's right. No, the prey to predator ratio is high, uh, as in the uh, in the uh, uh, oak woodland here, and it's much more suppressive to this. So we got more of this kind of activity going on in in that soil. Okay, so. Why are soils the way we see them? Uh, uh, 150 years ago, uh, 
in, in particularly in France, the idea of injecting toxins into the soil, poisons into the soil, in this case to, to control phylo uh, phylloxera, uh, uh, began to evolve. And carbon disulfide particularly was, uh, was the uh, material of choice at that time, and they either did it by hand injection or they had uh, uh, some kind of exotic machine that would go through the field and, and inject uh, carbon disulfide and controlled phylloxera in vineyards either before or, or uh, uh, during uh, planting. In about the 1950s, Walter Carter was working at the Pineapple Research Institute in, in uh, Hawaii, and he found out that, that some, uh, uh, some uh, byproducts of uh, uh, petroleum distillation were toxic to nematodes, and particularly the uh, material called dibro, dibromocropane, no, sorry, dibromochlorine, uh, no, hang on, wait a minute, I know this. No, di dibromopropane, dibromopropane. So, so what was called DD mixture. And uh, uh, when he injected DD mixture into the soil, then he killed the reniform nematode, Royal Anchus reniformis, which was uh, uh, which is a, a serious pest of pineapple, and uh, uh, and that of course uh, began the evolution of of. Uh, uh, soil fumigation for control of nematodes. And there were other derivatives of that. Uh, the DD mixture became, uh, 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 finally they, they decided that one of the, the dichloropropane was not as, as toxic as the dichloropropane. And, and so they it, it eliminated one of them. And, and now that it emerged as, uh, as telone 2, which is still widely used as a soil fumigant. So lots and lots of materials uh, put into soil that killed organisms. Uh, and I, I was working in Zimbabwe many years ago, and here was a, this was a tobacco production area. So back there at the field where they're going to plant tobacco, and this is the tobacco seed bed. So they want to put in, they want to grow the seedlings here, and then plant them out into the, into that other field. And so they're injecting uh, soil fumigants into the field at 12 inch intervals. And uh, and produce as a result beautiful tobacco seedlings, absolutely nematode free, and in many cases also would have fumigated this whole field the same way, injecting at 12 inch intervals uh, material into the soil. Uh, and that was not just being done in Zimbabwe; it was done all over the world, the United States as well. Uh, I, if we get time, I'll get back to this area back here because the, this is an interesting area of, of woodland. And uh, just so keep in mind, if I've got time, I'll get back to talking about that. Uh, anyway, so lots of other ways, you know, this, this development of, of putting, injecting materials into the soil, uh, the various shank combinations and for more, for more uh, volatile materials, covering them with plastic tarp and putting them through drip irrigation put a lot of toxic material into soil that has major, allows you to grow uh, wonderful crops if supported by mineral fertilizers and so on, but, uh, uh, but uh, not too good for the soil organisms. So here's some work in, in Costa Rica, and, and this is in an organic uh, uh, banana and plantain and cacao and uh, uh, native trees production area. Uh, and this is in a United Fruit uh, uh, banana plantation. Well, th this banana plantation produces enormous yields of, of, of bananas, so much so that you can see these ropes here, they're tying one, one plant to another so that it doesn't fall over because of the, uh, the weight of the bananas. So very productive systems. The, on the other hand, this uh, system not nearly as productive, but interestingly, uh, the bananas produced uh, can be used for baby food in the uh, European economic community, whereas the European uh, community is not too happy about this uh, once the, uh, the amount of pesticides and fertilizers is used. In this, what I'll call the industrial agricultural system, there are 50 applications per year of something. 
fertilizers, uh, insecticides, fungicides, nematicides, four applications a year for nematicides. So we take samples from, from these systems, and this is just the biomass of nematodes that are either herbivores or bacterials. Well, look at this. So the, this is the, this is the uh, uh, conventional system or the industrial system. Very few plant parasitic nematodes, very few herbivores. Why? Because they're getting four applications of nematicide a year. There, here, there's no, in the, in the organic system, no nematicide, but more regulation because of the, of the high abundance of predator nematodes uh, and, and uh, uh, things that are regulating these, uh, these species. And the predator nematodes are also there because there's a lot of bacterial feeding nematodes for them to feed on. So one, one is supporting the other. And uh, uh, so here I was also talking about species richness and diversity much more species richness in the organic system than in the, in the uh, uh, essentially industrial system. So we could say, well, what, what attributes of the food web are present? In this organic system, we've got producers, the, the producers of carbon, the fixers of carbon, the plants of various kinds, right? Uh, and then opportunistic species, nematodes and other organisms feeding on the roots, but they're being consumed by things that feed on them and are being consumed by things that feed on them. And all of these things are releasing uh, nutrients to the soil. And so the food web is functioning. As opposed to here, uh, the producers and fixers are there. They're growing very well. And, and there are some uh, organisms feeding on the plant roots. Uh, but they're also having to feed these systems with, with, uh, with a lot of... Uh, of fertilizers and regulate things with pesticides and so on. So from these kinds of experiments, we conclude this. Management practices in industrialized agriculture result in soil food with simplification, reduction in higher trophic levels in the soil food level, the parasites, I mean, the predators uh, uh, type levels, and reductions of species diversity. Okay, so it would be nice to redesign the, 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 the system to improve soil health, right? Uh, and the, the, the first step to do it is avoid destroying it. Uh, so here's a perennial grass field in, in uh, uh, Kansas with roots down to nine feet uh, of, 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 of soil. And it's torn out and replaced with an, an annual wheat field with roots that are six inches deep. And within one year, and I, without going to all this, within one year, we find that the, the structure index, the abundance of predators, has gone from here to here. Uh, and the, the basal index, those, those, those sort of survivalist nematodes have gone from here to here. So uh, very easily destroyed, the, the, the natural system very easily destroyed. Here we work with, uh, with mineral fertilizers. And uh, we different types of nematodes. So here we're increasing the amount of, of uh, nitrogen in, in the mineral fertilizer, in this case, the ammonium sulfate. And these are the predator nematodes, the generalist and specialist predator nematodes, knocked out at very low levels, whereas the, the, the bacterial feeders and fungal feeders and, and plant parasites far more tolerant. So what's the solution to that? We're going to minimize that damage? Well, maybe we wouldn't be using compost rather than mineral fertilizer, increase organic amendments, use manures, and fertigation. Uh, you know, in, so rather than putting on 300 units of, of nitrogen fertilizer to planting, why don't we, uh, if we've got drip systems or a way of doing this, put in fertilizer as needed for, by the plant? So we're, because that fertilizer dissolves in the soil solution where the nematodes and other organisms are, are uh, living, and pretty soon they're in a toxic soup uh, that, uh, that is not too good for them. We, we uh, I hope you're gonna tell me if I'm getting too late and I'm going too long here, Stephanie. Uh, here we, we worked with, with uh, 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 Dr. Jackson, who was in that case time working in, in France and uh, uh, looked at the biomass of bacterial feeding nematodes in relation to readily uh, readily uh, oxidizable carbon, right? So 
So as the, as the readily decomposed carbon increased, so we saw more bacterial feeding and nematodes. Well, we'd expect that, more bacteria, more bacterial feeding and nematodes. Then we relate the, 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 the metabolic footprint of the bacterial feeding nematodes or, or the, the biomass of predators, I should say, to the metabolic footprint. So the more abundant the, the bacterial feeding nematodes, the more nematode predators we get. And as a, res oops, uh, as a result of that, uh, we, we find that uh, if there are more predators present, we, we have more regulation of the plant feeding nematodes. So this is, again, this is the soil from that, that uh, uh, banana plantation in Costa Rica that was grown with the, the sort of natural cover crop and, and very diverse system. Very, uh, I mean, you can almost smell and taste the soil from the slide. And uh, what that- oh, right. is, Excuse me, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I, I will just give a little comment on the time here. Maybe you could wrap things up in the next few minutes. And then okay, I'll do that. I'll, okay, I'll, I'll do, do my last presentation and then we'll save some time for a Okay, I apologize for that. No worries, it's great. Away. Yep, okay. thank you. So the idea here then is that in the banana production system, we'd like to put in more organic material, increase the microbial biomass, increase as a result, what I'm calling the amplifiable prey, the nematodes that we can increase bacterial and fungal feeding nematodes by feeding them. They will provide food for the predator nematodes and for parasitic fungi, would then put pressure on the target nematodes, the target prey, the, uh, the plant feeding nematodes. So the idea of, of feeding the soil to, to enhance the food web. And uh, uh, here from, we're in, in California, we're using a, a winter cover crop. And the idea with the winter cover crop is we'd, we'd roll it down rather than incorporate it because I don't want to stir up the soil and disturb the environment for, for the, uh, the predator nematodes, uh, but try to create this thing. And this is not the same system, but try to create the, this uh, forest floor type of system that uh, uh, where roots of the of the plants would be close to the surface. There would be bacterial feeding nematodes, there'd be predator nematodes, and everybody would be interacting in the same place. So the idea of structuring the food web so that the the, the, just the interactors are here. And I love this uh, uh, idea or the, the, the uh, guidelines from the NRCS, the uh, idea of using mixtures keeping living, living uh, roots in the soil, avoiding resource punctuation, uh, avoiding that time of uh, stop, uh, stop farming in September when you harvest the crop and then wait till next spring to plant, but keep material in the soil to keep the, the soil populations active, the diversity of cover crops in the same way. And uh, uh, I think this is where to start. If, you, if you're going from a conventional system trying to get back to uh, to a more uh, sustainable or organic system, then uh, this is where to start. But but uh, it's it's easier not to have gotten to this stage before. It's easier to uh, uh, to get from there to here than, than from here to there. Uh, but remember the principles of pest management. So if we're growing cover crops. Let's not incorporate. Let's not include in the cover crops host plants that are uh, that are parasites of the of the main uh, main crop that we'd like to grow. And I was going to go take you to Nemoplex, but I'm not going to. Uh, but but essentially, there's a lot of material in there that would allow you to select uh, uh, crops that are either resistant or to or to understand the host status of uh, crops to plant parasitic nematodes. And thank you very very much. Thank okay. you very, very much. Thank you very, very much, Howard. Uh -huh. um, let's, I do want to give you the chance to demonstrate Nemoplex. So let me go, I've got like five, six minutes of slides to go through and okay. I'll finish that. And then in the meantime, you can queue up. Can I just take Nemoplex. 30 seconds here because I've just seen something on my slide here. Yeah, um, sure. Okay, I was teaching a, a short course on nematode ecology in Costa Rica. And so I had to collect uh, specimens to teach my class. And here along the stream, right next to the edge of the water, uh, nice muddy soil, and I found this nematode. This nematode is called Dolichodorus. Well, 
you go back to that that uh, slide or think about that slide where I, they were injecting soil fumigants in the soil in Zimbabwe, and there was a, a sort of wooded area behind. Uh, when I was sampling it, we, we, we used a soil auger usually with a four foot stem. We took the stem out and made it into an eight foot stem and went down to eight feet. And at the eight feet, we were at the water table. In the last sample, and then we extracted nematodes at each sec, six inch depth interval. At the last sample at the water table showed up this genus of nematodes, right? Never been seen or reported in that area before in wet conditions. Here in Costa Rica, it's in wet conditions. The only other place I know it to occur is in Florida along river banks. And uh, so it's just amazing to me how these things get around. Anyway, it's just, a, it's a, you know, a little nematological excitement. Uh, okay, thank you. Sorry. Sorry about that. That's great. No, thank you for sharing many layers of nematological excitement. Um, all right, I put the, the link for Nemoplex. That's also in the, the e packet of resources if you go through that. Thank you, Anna Howard, for your presentation and your time here. We've got some questions in the chat. We'll just uh, have Raven help us to moderate that. Yeah, so first question for Dr. Ferris here. Um, can we predict how much organic nitrogen is excreted from protozoa versus nematodes? Which is more efficient for plant available nitrogen? You mean which types of nematodes? I, I, I guess, say it again. Yeah, of course. Um, can we predict how much organic nitrogen is excreted from protozoa versus nematodes? Which is more efficient for plant available nitrogen? You know, I so I'm sure we can predict that, but it but it would be fairly similar, I think. And that in fact that that the conditions that are favorable for the bacterial feeding nematodes are exactly the conditions that would be favorable for for the protozoa, and so that that uh, if 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 favorable conditions are present, uh, they would both be uh, complementing each other in terms of the amount of nitrogen that was being uh, mineralized. Great. Um, if anyone else has any questions for Dr. Ferris, please put them in the Q and A section. Um, but right now, we're going to move on to some more general questions. Uh, so the first one. Um, have native earthworms reestablished in formerly glaciated areas? How do non-native earthworms impact native species? Yeah, I'll take that one quickly. And then Dr. Ferris, if you have anything to add, please jump in. So earthworms move and are distributed naturally very slowly. So native earthworms have not really re-established in formerly glaciated areas. I'm not aware of efforts to reintroduce them. I mean, they're they're extinct. So in places where um, there was glaciation, the presence of earthworms in that case are all non-native species. Uh, there's a follow-up, how do non-native earthworms impact native earthworms? That is a good question, and I don't, I don't, I'm not familiar or knowledgeable enough about that, unfortunately, to answer if there are studies or research about what they, how they interact in places where they do coexist. And then the second question is, is there evidence of evolved resistance to biocides, and if so, what are the ecological implications? Um, yeah, that's a very big question, I think. One quick, yes, there there certainly are cases where organisms have developed resistance to biocides. Herbicide resistance is one example of that with genetically modified crops that tolerate the application or of certain herbicide mode of action classes, different uh, weed species have emerged that are are tolerant to that. So, um, some ecological implications for that are, of course, that nature always finds a way. And even if many members of that weed group have been reduced because of the herbicide use, there are resistant strains that then kind of eliminate 
a lot of the tools that farmers have for managing weeds with that particular herbicide class. Awesome. Um, Howard, do you have anything else to add? Well, just in terms of that uh, uh, developing resistance, we've seen that with nematocytes, particularly with nematocytes that are um, that are not phytotoxic. You know, that you can you can apply repeatedly, for example, in orchards without causing damage to the trees, but but to reduce the nematode. And then after applying them repeatedly for some period of time, you realize you're not they're not uh, having an impact on the nematode community anymore. So. So the evolution of, of resistance does, does occur. Great. Um, another question for you, Dr. Ferris. Um, are there nematodes that eat wireworms? Uh, probably not eating them directly, but there are there are nematodes that we call uh, entomopathogenic nematodes that have inside their body a, a capsule of toxic bacteria, and uh, so when they when they attack uh, an insect, for example, uh, they uh, release the toxic bacteria. The toxic bacteria uh, kill the insect, grow on the uh, uh, on the, the the dead body, and the nematode feeds on the uh, on the bacteria in the dead body. So it's a it's a kind of a, so I I imagine that would happen with wireworms as well, but I don't know of any examples. Thank you. Um, next question, another general one. I have heard people say that alley cropping, et cetera, compete with the cash crop for available water. How significant is this competition? Does it balance out with the benefits to soil health, cover, OM, et cetera? I can take that one very quickly. That's a good question and it's certainly a, a valid concern, but I think as far as being able to say how significant the competition in really, there's no one answer for that. It, it varies a lot on the climate of the area, the soil type, the crop type, the particular weather of that year. I'm familiar with some examples from Mediterranean climates um, with olives in particular as the, the crop and using winter annuals as the, the alley crop or cover crop. So those are the nest or not really competing for water during the summer when water deficit would be at its peak concern. So yeah, good question, but I think it really um, varies case by case. Got it. Um, another question, more farmers are using brassica cover crops to control nematode populations. Can you speak to the benefit of this biofumigation functions and the possible impacts on beneficial nematode species? Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, yeah, so so biofumigation is uh, an important and emerging uh, strategy. Uh, uh, often it's uh, it's more effective if there is some kind of a, a tarping system, for example, in in greenhouses and so on. Uh, but but definitely we've seen uh, effects in in uh, the plant parasitic nematodes uh, related to to brassica cover crops. Now. What impact does it has have on on uh, uh, non parasitic nematodes? I think that the uh, uh, that the bacterial and fungal feeding nematodes are sufficiently resilient uh, that they would uh, they would recover very rapidly if they are impacted. Uh, uh, but I sort of have a feeling that the predator, the larger predator nematodes. Uh, would 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 be impacted, but I don't know that, and I don't know that anybody has really done that study. I mean, it's an important important issue. I don't I don't think we have looked at it thoroughly enough. Great. Next question. Um, any comments on biochar? Go ahead, Dr. Ferris, if you have any. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> You know, we've thought about it a lot. I don't see any evidence of, of benefit in terms of nematode management. I, I mean, there's been a lot of thinking about it, but in terms of, of experimentally uh, re relate, related to nematodes, not really much has been done. So I, on the other hand, I think that any uh, 
any way of, of incorporating carbon into soil is a good thing. So you. how do you put it in? You put it in if it's if it's in biochar form or you put it in pre-biochar, but I, I think in, uh, always it's a good thing to get it more carbon into the soil. Mm -hmm. we, we have depleted carbon in the soil in agricultural systems. Uh, here in California, we, we're looking at 1% at organic matter, and we look at the, at the surrounding areas of those fields, and it's 2 or 3% organic matter. And it's difficult to get that percentage up. Good. Okay. Um, we're, we got through all the questions. Thank you, Raven. And thank you, everyone, for posting those. I think we've got eight eight or so minutes left, and it, it would be great to have you demonstrate the, the website, Howard. Well, I'll just show you a little, little now. I'm going to make it. We'll have to have you go back and do that screen sharing. Okay. Uh-huh. Hang on, let me do this. Screen sharing. So that's so you're gonna tell me how to do that again because I don't see anything that says keep screen sharing. I know you've told me a hundred times. So no. task bar. There Good. we go. You can see our faces. We go to here and now we go to share screen. And now we go to, to which one am I looking at? Uh, I'm looking at this one here, I think. There it is. Okay, and so here's where I was, and here I was. Okay, now I should be able to do that. Now I was sharing. Yeah, you'll have to reshare it. So go out of sharing. Okay. So stop, wow. stop sharing the screen. New share? Yeah, new share. Okay. And this time, choose the website as what you share instead of the PowerPoint. That's where we lose you is it doesn't make the jump. Say that again. I So you're not seeing my website. Right. Uh -huh. You'll have to stop share because we're seeing the PowerPoint. So stop sharing that. Sorry, folks. Stop video, stop share, stop there. Oh, stop share, I see it. Mm -hmm. Great, and then reshare, but choose the window with your website on it. Looks Is that good. It? Yeah, you can see it. Okay, so okay, so what I want to do is is uh, Nemaplex is a website that that essentially I, it's like my stamp collection. You know, I I, uh, I I said when I get older I'll I have a stamp collection. Well, actually I started this when I was younger, but the idea is that everything I ever wanted to know or ever knew about nematodes. So I enter Nemaplex, and there's all kinds of things about uh, you know. Uh, Types of nematodes and and their biology and behavior and history of nematology or classification and and biology. But what I really wanted to show you today, uh, and there's some teaching resources. But what I really wanted to show you today uh, was Nemabase. And Nemabase is a uh, uh, a database of the host status of plants to nematodes. And I have it set up to where you could. Select a nematode, for example, you could have all nematodes, or you could say, I want to, let's take one like, uh, say, Hoplolimus, so I can get there. So we'll take uh, Hoplolimus columbus. Uh, so Hoplolimus columbus is a is a, what's called a stunt nematode, it's a plant parasite, uh, impacts uh, cotton and uh, uh, soybeans. Uh, important in the southeastern United States, and we'll say all host records. So, so I want to find out uh, what species. So now, what's telling me all of these, all of the known literature on uh, plants that are uh, resistant or susceptible uh, or have 
been studied in any way to Hopolimus columbus, right? So a lot of them. Now, perhaps what I want to do is change the type of search, and maybe I'm interested in uh, plant usage. I would like to know, for example, uh, plants that I could use as a cover crop for Hopolimus columbus. Get myself back down to there. So there are lots of species of nematodes that are in here, of course. Probably one of that wise and we just be select a couple of Imus Columbus, especially now that. Uh, uh, well, let me let me uh, select another one. So I'll select this one. Of course, I select the one that do another search. Okay. Change it to type this search, right? and and so I I was interested in selecting a cover crop with resistance to. You know, part of the problem is that you guys have got your faces right in the middle of my. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, they're very attractive faces, but it's just. Uh, it's just the way the slide bar is going back. Yep. Okay. So Hoplolimus columbus is somewhere around here. So now, now I, I'm, I'm saying I want to grow a cover crop. I want to know what cover crops might be available. That means they have got resistance to Hoplolimus columbus. And so there are very few of them. And there, there are some varieties of soybeans they suggest might work as a cover crop or a green manure. And uh, uh, yeah, so various species of, of crops that might be available. And, and here's, if we wanted more information, notice that they're all resistant or moderately resistant to the nematode. Uh, uh, but then let's say that we wanted to, uh, I'm not gonna take too long of this. Let's say we didn't know much about Hoplolimus columbus. We could go down here to uh, the index of generative nematodes and and here are all the nematodes that I have in the database, or, or the ones with the G and H thing. I was going to Hoplolimus. Here. And so there are all kinds of species of Hoplolimus, and we were talking about Hoplolimus. And so the ones that are underlined or blue are ones that I have information in. Uh, others, I'm just recognizing that they exist. And so we could go to the Hoplolimus Columbus page, learn something about the characteristics of the nematodes, what it looks like, uh, where, where it lives in the world, economic importance, its feeding habits, and, and so on. So, okay, I, I think that's all I need to show you about Namaplex. Uh, just that it exists and it's the kind of thing that you, uh, if it's of any interest to you, you might want to explore yourself uh, and all these, uh, uh, the various uh, attributes of it. So we could, for example, go to plant parasites here and uh, here my friend, uh, <laughs> so a little sidebar here. This is a guy I was working in Mexico with some colleagues and uh, uh, this guy was growing, uh, uh, peppers and uh, tomatoes uh, where he was using uh, uh, biofumigants. So he was using actually uh, some brassicas and, uh, and other biofumic material uh, and under tarp before he planted his, uh, his peppers. And so he's showing you here, this hand that you can't see is showing that the, the peppers are two or three times higher uh, or, or, or you no. Know, 30 or 40 centimeters higher than they were without the uh, without the biofumigant, and when uh, when you dug into the roots, you could see very very great differences with the uh, uh, the populations of nematodes and the symptoms on the root. Okay, enough of that. So that's that's Nemoplex. Howard, there's a, a new question. Thank you so much for walking us through some of that and for building it and making it available. It looks amazing. Yeah, it's available and, and easily accessed. Yeah. I, I hope. 
And if it's not, please call me and I'll try and make it. <laughs> we got a new question in for you about Nemabase. Go ahead, Raven, if you would, please. Yeah, of course. So which choice for plant usage would we use for perennial grasses? So which, say that again. Which, which, which choice for plant usage would we use to search for perennial grasses? Oh, okay. So can we go back into it? Or am I out of that? Sure, you're allowed to, yeah. Just share. You're, you're out of it now, but yeah, you can go back. Now I'm in? No. No, you'll need to share your screen again. I wish you'd make it more idiot proof. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Looks good. Is that it? Yeah, you got it. Okay, good. Whew. Okay, so we're going to uh, Nematode Management, go to NEMA base and uh, so we want to see what are perennial grasses that are not affected by nematodes, for example. Would that be a reasonable question? Uh, can I do that? Let's see. Because I, I think that I would say I think plant usage. Yeah. Also, maybe the question, yeah, plant usage, is there a, something in the drop-down menu that matches perennial grass? Yeah, so mainly they're about uses, not about plant types. So let me go back again a little. Uh, uh, no, nah, don't do that. There's pretty. I'm I'm not back, am I? Not better. We'll have to get you to reshare the screen again. How am I doing that? Remind me. So find Zoom and the little green button at the bottom. Oh, yeah. Find Zoom. I already found the ones. Oh, show task bar. Okay. Show task bar. And Z. And then share. Now what? So now you're on your presentation. Did you want to share the website again? There we go. That looks good. Okay. So you keep telling me it's closed. Okay. So, so I'm going to Nemabase and I'm trying to think about. Plant usage, so it's not plant usage, so you go to plant type. Yeah, it looks like the person who asked this question just actually resubmitted another statement, and they said that they found it under a plant type, and thank you. <laughs> so, okay, perennial grass as well. So we're looking at perennial grasses, and we're looking at all nematodes, for example. Yeah. So there we go. So now we can say, now I should say that each one of these columns can be can be sorted. So uh, the, the susceptibility column, I can sort it. And uh, and so we got moderately resistant. And of course, we also need to know what kind of nematode that, that are involved here, right? So I could search by, I could, uh, so now I've got, I've got the, so important in selecting the perennial grasses is what, uh, what types of nematodes are involved. So we've got the anguina, that, that is a seed gall nematodes, and these are stem and bulb nematodes, I mean, the leaf gall nematodes, as opposed to the Dytolancus. Now we're doing with some of the, the soil, Nematode. So we we would select also a nematode type that we were interested in, because uh, you know there are a ton of perennial grasses, and uh, and we know we want to know who's resistant to what. So we went to uh, let's see, we go to the top. Search 
And so we want to go back to perennial grasses and we would say we're interested in grass perennial and we would say a spe specific nematode. Now we're interested in, in a particular nematode that was in that field. And uh, let's say I would select, uh, uh, this would be interesting, uh, Globodera, which is a cyst forming nematode, Globodera rostockiensis, a potato cyst nematode, and process the query. Ah, interesting. No, none. Re now, the fact that it doesn't show any means either I don't haven't collected the data or nobody did the experiment. You know, so so I'm only reporting what what occurs in the literature and uh, uh, people are more likely to indicate that they that this is a host than it is a non host. Uh, so so it's pretty interesting to to think of the biases that that are. Uh, that are involved in just the way data are reported or not reported. You know, if you don't find the nematode feeding on the root, you don't say anything about it. If you do find this, the nematode feeding on the root, then it's it's pretty important and you, you would report it. On the other hand, if you're doing a study looking for host plant resistance of uh, uh, plants to nematodes, then, then that would become Let's see. I think in the interest of, of time, Dr. Ferris, several people are saying thank you and they're having to, to jump off here. Well, I understand um, that. I, I, uh -huh. okay. I wasn't sort of prepared to do a, a whole Nemoplex thing, but good. That was, that was good to see some of its capabilities yeah. there. Well, it's, it's a, a self-entertainment kind of thing. <laughs> There's, there's one more question in the Q&A. Let's go ahead and do that, if you would, please, Raven. Sure. Great, yeah. Um, so for biofumigants, does the effect take place after the incorporation of the cover crop into the soil? Does the effect occur then? Does the effect take place after incorporation of the cover crop into the soil? Yes. Yes, that's, that's uh, the idea is that the incorporation is, is uh, uh, kind of breaking up the, the plant material and the uh, uh, glucosinolate uh, uh, effect is, uh, is, comes into impact with myrosinase, which is the enzyme in the leaves. And so it has to be kind of uh, broken up for the enzyme to reach the, the glucosinolate and that, that produces the uh, isothiocyanates that kill the nematodes. Great. Um, we have a couple other questions coming in. Um, Steph, do we want to stay on for a couple more minutes? Um, or do we? Oh, you're muted. We've got these two here. Let's take those and then we'll cut it off after that. Thank you so much, everyone, for the questions. Yeah, and of course, also, if you do have questions, please feel free to email soils at Xerces.org and we will forward them to Howard and answer them the best that we can if you think of anything after this. So. Now for the last two questions, um, how can someone get help finding out if a nematode is causing the problem in a crop? <laughs> uh, so, the, you know, the, the standard answer to that would be uh, call your local farm advisor. Uh, but in California, at least, there are a lot of diagnostic labs, not a lot, there are probably a dozen diagnostic labs that uh, provide that kind of service that would uh, would recognize or be able to identify the species of nematodes present and uh, whether or not they were uh, parasitic on the crop that you, that you were growing. Uh, if, uh, now, with some nematodes, there are distinct symptoms. You can see galls on the roots or cysts attached to the roots or something. And uh, you know, the more cysts, the more galls, the, the, the poorer the crop is grown and there's a, that cause and effect kind of, kind of linkage. In other cases, uh, you know, there are no obvious symptoms on the plant, or no obvious symptoms can, can be ascribed to to a, a specific organism, other than the plant is not growing as well, or it looks nitrogen deficient, or it looks like it wilts in the midday, uh, which is usually a pretty good indicator that that something is affecting the roots, 
And then if you if you took soil samples and find high populations of plant parasitic nematodes, you'd you'd ascribe them to that. Uh, you know, and, and uh, there's probably our reports. You know, we probably already know what nematodes damage what what crops. Uh, so it would be a question of doing some literature research. Great. Uh, and then the last question: Do you have to cover the soil with a tarp? Ah, for uh, going back to the biochar. Yeah, topics. we're back to the, we're back to uh, to uh, brassicas, right? Uh, so no, you don't. Uh, but it seems as though the the places where I've seen the brassicas work most dramatically have been in greenhouse production systems in Mexico. And where they're growing the uh, the plants in soil in the greenhouse, not in pots, but but uh, but in the greenhouse floor, and uh, uh, they incorporate uh, uh, the the uh, uh, glucose, no, the, the brassicas and brassica type materials into the plant row, and they cover it with a tarp, and then they have a drip system there that's, that's keeping it moist, and uh, uh, that seemed to do a really good job. Now, now uh, you know. The, the brassicas are releasing uh, various isothiocyanates, which are the nematocyte materials, and uh, they are volatile. So it seems that covering with a tarp would be better than not covering with a tarp. On the other hand, if you're doing it on a field scale, the cost of, of uh, covering it with a tarp would be astronomical, and, and the cost of disposing of the tarp would be astronomical. So if, if you're doing it in your backyard, I think you can cover it with a tarp and and, uh, and, and enhance it. But if you're doing it on a big scale, uh, I think it would not be cost effective.